Okay. If you're not familiar with Paul, uh, he is the uh, publisher of Paul's Fountain Pen Journal. He just showed his new uh, issue that's going to be coming out here pretty soon. He is a published author. Here is one of his books, second edition of uh, Fountain Pen's Past and Present, and he is the Grand Poobah of the Black Pen Society. Paul, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and, and doing this. We're really excited to have you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It really is. Uh, it, today, I, uh, the topic for discussion, once I get this thing clicked on there, there we go. Okay. Um, the thing we're talking about today is how to build a fountain pen collection. And uh, basically, uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about vintage pens or modern pens. Uh, a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about are pretty much, they apply to, uh, to both. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, basically what I'm going to tell you are, it's just my insights and my opinions on things. You might get another person here who's been collecting pens for 40 years. That person might tell you exactly the opposite thing. So, you know, take all of this stuff with a grain of salt. It's just some of the things that I've, um, you know, uh, been able to uh, uh, accumulate over the last 40 years of collecting fountain pens. Um, you know, one thing it, I'm kind of interested in knowing is how many people are actually interested in vintage fountain pens? How is it possible to tell Kenneth? I, I can't. Uh, yeah, if everybody wants to type yes into chat or something like that, I know I am. We've got Carolyn saying yes, Anna, Dell, Kristen. I know Dave's got several, Brian, Susan. Yep, looks like a lot of folks are. Okay, so so basically, I can I can talk about uh, the Brian, uh, the uh, the vintage pens, especially. Absolutely. Um, the uh, you know if if you're if you're going to really get into vintage fountain pens, and I'm, I I don't know how many people here are really experienced or how many people are just starting off with the vintage pens. Um, but, you know, it's really important to build a good foundation when, when you want to start thinking about vintage fountain pens. And, and by that, I mean, you need to get information because information is key. The more information you have, the more knowledge you have, the, the better an understanding you're going to have about pens and the more appreciation you're going to have for them. And, and you don't want to get all of your information from one source. I, and, and that source basically meaning the internet. Um, you know, the internet has an awful lot of good information. It really does. But it also has an awful lot of bad information. And I mean, really bad information. I remember listening to a couple of things on, uh, you know, a talk about this or that. And I mean, I, I literally cringed because it was absolutely wrong what the people were saying. And, you know, some of the fountain pen boards that I've been on, um, you know, I remember in particular, one, one woman had a, uh, she had a Lamy 2000, which is one of my favorite pens. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful pen. And it's a pen that I would recommend to anybody. And she was complaining about the pen. She was saying that it wasn't any good because it was scratchy and the ink flow wasn't very good. And, and there were like two pages of dialogue about this or about that. And, and I'm over here thinking, I said, well, did anybody ask her, you know, is she writing big with a extra fine point fountain pen? You know, and then somewhere down there, I got, it got lost, but somebody said it, but everybody was talking about all this other stuff that made absolutely no sense and it had absolutely no bearing on what was going on. So in other words, if you don't have a lot of reliable sources in terms of where you're getting your information from, you could easily go barking up the wrong tree when it comes to getting vintage fountain pens. So, so that's one thing that I would encourage people to do. And, and I wanna thank Ken for showing my book. That book, by the way, is out of print, but it's, uh, it's available. You, know, you could probably get it in Amazon. You could get it uh, on eBay. It's not a lot of money. I think they're probably selling for 20, $25. And it's, it's, it's a good book. It's probably the most, popular book out there on fountain pens. 
and it's and it's not expensive. So I would definitely invest in that one and, and, and get the uh, get the second edition, the one that that uh, well here I, I have a couple of I'm going to show you a couple of books. Get this one if you can. It says second edition on it. It's there. I made so many changes between this one and the first edition that this one's definitely, you know, a better a better one to get. And the other thing that I, I put in this book that, um, you know, was a real issue with me was I tried not to be prescriptive. Uh, the one thing that I really wanted to do was to write the book in such a way so that it, it would allow people to determine for themselves what they want, rather than telling them, you know, what, how much a pension costs or what they should get or what they shouldn't get. Because the thing about vintage fountain pens, you know, as far as I'm concerned, one critical issue is, is you, you should get what you like. You really should get what you like. Don't listen to what people are, you know, what they're telling you it's hot, what they're telling you you should collect, you know, what they're telling you is, uh, you know, uh, a, a good pen because it has this or that. You really want to collect pens that you want because you want them, not because somebody else is telling you that you should want them, all right? And, and the other thing too is here, here's another book that I would highly recommend, all right? This is uh, by Jim Marshall and Lawrence Oldfield. It is a book on pen repair. This, this book can save you a ton of money. You know, and, and the other thing about when you're getting into vintage pens, you know, what you wanna do is for the effort that you put into something, you wanna get maximum enjoyment out of it. And you don't wanna throw money away. You, you don't wanna, you know, you don't wanna waste money if, it's, if, it's, if you don't have to. This thing um, is really a wonderful book. It, 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 it shows you exploded diagrams of all the pens and pencils. It, it tells you what what is uh, a weak point in all the pens. It tells you what to watch out for when you're making repairs. And the other thing too is is that if you if you learn how to make certain basic repairs, they're it's going to cover eighty percent of the pens that you encounter. You know, it's 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 really not that hard to learn how to take uh, to put in an ink sack. All right, it's just not that big a deal. You can do it. It's, it's not that hard, it seems hard. And actually the first time, a couple of times I did it, it, it was hard, but it's really worth your while to learn how to do uh, a vacuumatic filling system. And after you do three or four, it's a piece of cake, right? It really isn't that hard to do. And in fact, Brian McQueen, I think has a pretty good video on, on how, to, how to do that. Um, it's, it's really not hard to learn how to put in a, um, you know, to do a button filler filling mechanism. So between the button filler mechanism, the lever filler and the vacuumatic filling system, that's like 70 to 80% of the pens that you're going to encounter. Plus you'll save 50, 60 bucks on every pen instead of shipping it out to somebody to get it fixed. And you won't have to wait six months to get it back. And on top of that, it's really a lot of fun. It's really a pleasure to fix a pen. One of the things I love doing is, and, and the other thing is, you know, I can look at a pen and I can see beyond the dirt. And I don't, I don't even see that. When I'm looking at a pen, I see the pen afterwards. And, and I know how beautiful it's going to look. And it is very satisfying to be able to take a dirty looking pen and to restore it and to bring it back into, into working condition and, and so that it looks beautiful. And, and it's, it's, really, it's really a lot of fun. The only time it isn't fun is when somebody wants to buy that pen and you haven't restored it and you have to do it. And that's, then it becomes work, all right? But, but if, if it's something that I don't have to do because somebody wants it right now, then I mean, I love, I love it's very relaxing just restoring fountain pens. And, and bringing them back to life and making them usable again. You know, that's, that's a big part of the hobby. That's a big part of the fun. And, um, you know, you don't have to do it. You may be the type of person who would prefer to get, you know, just get a pen that has been refurbished, entirely refurbished and it's ready to write. And that's fine. Um, but if you do learn how to do basic repairs, you can get a lot of satisfaction out of it and you can save a lot of money.
And then you could take the money that you save and you can buy more pens. So you can look at it that way. Uh, another pen that I, or a book that I, I really like, and that I think, um, you know, is this one. This one is by Stuart Schneider and, uh, my God, I can't believe I'm forgetting, George Fischler. It's terrible. It must be this COVID thing. Anyhow, this is a great book, right? And it's one that's worth getting. You can, I'm, I'm, you can get these books on eBay. Now, uh, I don't even know if this one's in print anymore either. Um, but it's something to look for. And it's the first one. He did two books. You want to get the first one, this one, with the blue cover, I think. Yes, the Golden Age of Writing Instruments. And then lastly, the one that I would start with is this one. This one is by Andy Lambro. And this is an expensive book. Okay, it's called Fountain Pens of the World. And it comes in a, you could tell it costs a lot of money. But again, you can get this one probably for about a hundred bucks, a hundred and a quarter. It's well worth it, well worth it. This, this book has just about every pen ever made in it. And it gives you the history of all the pens. It's really a fabulous pen or book. Then, um, you know, there are other books and they're all good. And the thing is, is if you get one really important piece of information from each book that you read, it's going to be worth the price. I mean, it'll be well worth the price. If, if it, you know, I don't even know how else to say it. Plus, you're going to get a much better understanding of fountain pens because each one of these people comes at fountain pens from a different perspective. You know, it's everybody has a different point of view on these things. And it's not a matter of one being right or one being wrong. Um, you want to get, you want to keep an open mind. And you want to, you really want to, um, you know, read as much as you can, in addition to getting information from, from the internet. So, and, and of course, the other thing, uh, Ken showed that earlier too. Uh, I put out a fountain pen journal. It's primarily a, um, a journal about vintage pens, but it's, um, it covers a lot of, basically it covers the hobby at large. It covers any, any, anything having to do with our hobby uh, is fair game for that fountain pen journal. And recently I just added a, uh, a fellow who in fact uh, added a new cartoon section to the journal. So I'm pretty proud of this. He, uh, I don't know, oops, wrong page. He, he does cartoons. So now we have uh, we have cartoons in the uh, in the journal, which to me is a big deal. And uh, I mean, at twenty five bucks a year for three issues, to me it's a no brainer. But then again, I'm a little biased, so you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, so you know, you really you really want to read a lot. I'll give you an example. This is, I mean, this is a perfect example of why it's important. So when I started out, I, I read everything. I still do. I mean, I read everything. And um, I also collect wristwatches. And, and you think pens are expensive. Well, you, if you ever get into wristwatches, you'll, you, you know, you'll understand. So, so this is, honest to God, this is about 40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago, somewhere around there. And, um, I went into an antique shop and, and the guy had a pen or a, a watch and it was a Masonic watch and it was shaped like a triangle and he wanted a hundred dollars for it. And I said, Oh my God, a hundred dollars. You know, it was a lot of money for me back then. And uh, I said, you know, there's something about the watch. I remember reading something about that watch. I, I don't really remember exactly what it was, but I remember that it was something and it was significant. So I took a shot, I bought the watch and, and I brought it to my pen club meeting. And, and one of the people who was in the um, pen club was also an antique dealer. And he gave me $500 for that watch plus $1,500 worth of pens. And I had spent $100 on that watch. So, I mean, I didn't really want to watch, but I got $500 cash plus $1,500. And I sold all the pens, by the way. So, you know, um, that happens. It really happens. Uh, you know, oh, I, 
I was going through a trash uh, a bins at a, um, you know, just I remember finding this thing. Uh, and it was like in a cheap box at one of the pen shows. It was totally tarnished, you know, and I, um, I said, oh, I got it. You know, that doesn't look like steel to me. So I took it home and I just, just yesterday cleaned it. Turns out it's a Tiffany, Tiffany ballpoint pen, you know, that I got for $5 in a, you know, cheap box at a pen show. So all, you, ought, you ought to really look through the pens when you go to a pen show and you're looking through the pens, don't be afraid to take off the caps and take a good look. I found another pen. It was a Higgins pen, just a cheap, looked like a $40 pen, right? I unscrewed the cap. It had this beautiful music nib in it. And if anybody knows anything about music nibs, you, you can't get near them for under 200 bucks minimum, you know, probably more. So, you know, it pays to look, it pays to have information, it pays to have knowledge. Knowledge is everything in the hobby, especially if you're going to get into vintage pens. It really is important. And, uh, you know, there's more ways to get knowledge. And I, I was going to talk about that a little bit later, but um, I might as well talk about it now. Um, get a mentor, join a pen club, you know, hook up with people who know about vintage pens. There are people who want to pass on this information. As far I, I'm doing this because, you know, I, I want to pass it on to future generations. And, and, and so much of the knowledge and information that we have gets lost. And it's a shame. You know, I think of all these people like Susan Worth, who are, you know, these people are friends of mine. And, you know, all the knowledge that they had. And, and where is it now? You know, it's because without writing it down or, or passing it on to other people, it just gets lost. And that's a real shame. So, so if you, I mean, you really have to work at this thing. And the thing is, is it's not a chore. It's not a chore at all. It's a lot of fun. And if you look at it as being a chore, it's going to be a problem for you. But if you look at this thing as being a learning experience and as an opportunity to have a lifelong hobby that's going to be very rewarding, you're in for a ball. I mean, you really are. And, you know, and, and I, I mean, I've been trying to get people interested in vintage pens for a long time. And it's kind of like beating my head against the wall. And, and like a friend of mine said, you could bring somebody to a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, it's, it's up to them, really. I mean, you know, and, and a lot of the reason why they don't seem to be interested in vintage pens is, and they tell me, they said, well, we're a little bit afraid of them. You know, and but that's not what they mean. They're not afraid of them. It's more like they don't know how to operate the filling mechanisms. You know, they they're at a pen show. They come across a guy like me. I know everything. They don't know anything. How are you going to negotiate? You know, with somebody who knows a lot more than you do about pens. That's why I say, you know, when you're going to a pen show or you're going to a pen club meeting, find somebody who you trust, who you can deal with and find yourself a mentor if you can and you, you'll you know you'll it'll just move you miles ahead you know um most people are more than willing to help you out with vintage pens they want to and uh i would take advantage of that i really would and uh it, it, you'll find that it's very rewarding so you know i made a couple of points up here uh if you're if you're going to get into vintage pens, especially, uh, or with any collection, it doesn't matter if they're vintage or otherwise, you, you're, you're going to have to have some kind of focus. You know, you're going to have to ask yourself some questions. Well, you know, what is it about pens that I like? Is it that I like, uh, you know, the way they write? Is it that I like all the different filling systems? Is it that I like all the different materials that they're made out of? Is it that I like the evolution over a period of time? You know, do I like Art Deco stuff? So I want to focus on Art Deco pens. Do I want to focus on Art Nouveau pens? You know, so so you have to have some kind of focus. And, and the thing is, is that focus is going to change over a period of time. It, it really will. I mean, you'll start here, you'll start collecting one thing. And then as you progress, you're going to get interested in other areas. 
And, uh, you know, you don't know where that's really going to take you. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. And the other thing, too, is that, um, you know, when you start out with vintage pens, especially, and, and it, they don't have to be vintage pens, generally people are very enthusiastic about the hobby. They get into it and they have a tendency to collect everything. You know, the first year or two, next, you know, they, they look at their, I, I did this. After about two or three years, I, I took all the pens I had and I dumped them on the kitchen table. And I had a lot of pens. And I realized that I had spent thousands of dollars on pens. And all these pens that I thought, I, then I started noticing that some had hairline cracks, some were really discolored, some were this, some were that, you know, some I should have just left there. And, and you know, I had wasted a lot of money because I hadn't put in the time uh, finding out information about the pens. I hadn't been careful in terms of looking them over to make sure that there weren't any flaws. And, and I ended up, you know, with a pile of junk, you know, not that all of them were, but a lot of them were. And, you know, I put the good ones aside and then the other ones I used for parts, but it was an expensive lesson. And I think you can't avoid doing that to some extent, but you can, you can avoid some of the pitfalls that I fell into when I started, you know, again, this was 40 years ago. So, so you want to, you want to, you want to think about that. You know, the other thing too, is if you have any questions, just to ask away, Ken can, you know, just type them in and, you know, interrupt me and we'll just go on because I've got notes and I can just pick up here. So we so did get wanna, one question. Yeah. From Michelle, a minute ago, you were talking about uh, kind of finding a focus. You know, do you like Art Deco? Do you like materials? Uh, right. Michelle asks, and this is something I, I definitely identify with. What if you like all of that? What do you I do. Think? Well, you're talking to the right person. I mean, I like everything. I Everything. I, I start, I, I collect wood pencils. I can't believe how much similarity there is between the history of wooden pencils in fountain pens. You know, I, I, I love Art Deco. Who doesn't, right? I love Art Nouveau. I mean, I love postmodern. I, I love it all. I, so I'm a happy guy. I mean, to me, it's not a problem. But the thing is, is, you know, I've only got so much, well, I got more money than when I was 30, at least, you know, that's a good thing. But part of the reason is because I smartened up a little bit. And instead of spending all this full price on fountain pens, I learned how to do some of the things myself. And um, I learned how to be a little, uh, I learned how to wheel and deal, which I love. I, I mean, I really enjoy that. To me, that's a big part of it is, is the wheeling. And, but some people don't like to wheel and deal. And that's okay too, you know, but if you do like to wheel and deal, you can have a ball at pen shows. You can really have a lot of fun. You know, you could take all of those pens that you felt that you made a mistake on or you don't want anymore. And you could trade them with other collectors for pens that you do want. And it really works well. You know, it really, when we could talk a little bit about that, there's a couple of guidelines. If you're going to start wheeling and dealing with fountain pens, uh, there's a few things you really should know. Because I've been on the other end of the table for 40 years. And uh, I could tell you some of the things that people have done that really turned me off. You know, and, and if anything, when they wanted to wheel and deal, instead of the price going down, the price went up because they just acted like idiots, you know, they were absolutely just horrible. And so you don't want to do that. You know, you want to, you want to negotiate a fair price for you and for me and something that we can both live with. So there's ways of doing that. So, uh, you know, so there is a lot of learning involved. You know, you really have to learn about condition, about the fountain pens because Condition is a huge factor that affects price. And, and if you don't know the difference between, uh, you know, wear and just surface dirt, and if you don't know what kind of flaws are more, um, uh, you know, affect the value of a pen more than others, then, then you're going to be in trouble. Um, because the price between a pen that's in, you know, near mint, and one that's in say good condition, it could be double or triple the price. So, so you have to learn how to do that. And if you don't know how to do that, then you need to learn how to do that. 
And that only comes with time and experience. It really does. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, let's say there's a Parker dual fold, a senior Mandarin yellow dual fold, right? That's expensive pen. And let's say it has a cracked nib. Okay, well, it's got a cracked nib, that's a problem. Let's say that you have a big Chilton, number eight, and that has a cracked nib, okay? Is it an equal problem? The answer is no, it is not an equal problem because you can get a nib for that Parker Duofold very easily for say a hundred bucks, maybe even less. If you have <laughs> try finding an eight size nib for a Chilton, it's probably gonna cost you two or $300 if you can even find one. So, so that's an example of what I mean. You know, uh, a cracked barrel, for example, is a far worse problem than a crack, a hairline crack in the uh, in the cap, because if if the barrel is shot, uh, you know, that's that's an expensive proposition. If if the lever isn't working on a fountain pen, that's a serious flaw because lever repair is expensive on a on a good pen. So so you have to know you know about the condition and what it's going to cost to get a pen restored. It's a lot safer to deal with somebody that you trust and to deal with somebody who has guarantees and who's gonna offer restored pens for a fair price. You can't get hurt that way, um, but you can save a lot of money if you're willing to venture out on your own and learn how to do this stuff yourself. And, and you can get a lot of satisfaction in doing it as well. It's just a lot of fun. You know, if, if, you're, if you like that sort of thing, and I, I do, to me that's, I go to a pen show, I don't stop talking for four days. I, I really don't, I'm worse than Ann. I mean, you know, I just, I just, I love going to these shows. I love me being with people and um, I love the action. I really do. And it's just a lot of fun. And you can be a part of that if you get into it like that. So, you know, we were talking about focus. The other thing too is, you know, you might find that ultimately you like doing pen repair or you like, might like doing nib repair. So you can get off into these little side hobbies as well. And, and you can actually make money doing this. Um, you, another thing that, well, I'll give you an example. This is something that if you're gonna get into vintage pens, you wanna get involved in is, is ephemera. You know, if you take a look at these ads, this ad, believe it or not, look at the condition of this ad. It's a love, it's a beautiful ad. This ad is a hundred years old. And it's got a it's got a ton of information in it. You know, it's primary source information rather than some collector telling you some myth about a fountain pen. You can go here, have a beautiful ad in your collection. Instead of buying all these desk pens, which would take up a ton of space, you can look at the ad, get the information all for ten dollars, right? And and have a nice ad. There's just the I've got hundreds of ads. I, they're not all necessarily the um, these are big. You know, the Nat Geo had a lot of ads. So, I mean, look, at, there's a ton of information in here. You know, it tells you when this particular style pen was made, 1929. I bet you a dollar it says it on here someplace. 1929. So, you know, so you can look at it and you can say, oh, there's that rhomboid band, uh, double, you know, with the little bands on 1929 with all the different nibs with the interchangeable points. There's just, when, in fact, when I wrote my first fountain pen book, um, people thought I knew a lot about fountain pens. Well, I wrote that book when there were only two other fountain pen books out. And, and it's not that blue one, by the way, I wrote another one with a yellow cover and it's got a Parker 75 on the, on the cover, Parker 75 nib. But I was lucky because I was able to go into an antique shop and I was able to buy all the Nat Geos from like 1900 up to 1960, every one of them. So I, I bought them all and on the back or in, inside the, each of those issues month by month was, you know, there were ads by Parker, Schaefer, Waterman. And, and I was able to talk and look at the ads, get the information off the ads, look at them and see what changes occurred from year to year. And I was able to use that as information for the book that I wrote. 
and it was very helpful. So ads, pamphlet, any of this information that's period is, is it's worth its weight in gold and, and they're beautiful. I mean, I've got a couple hanging up. You could probably see them that right back there is a Waterman ad, just a couple more. I, I love the ads. Here's the uh, Parker 51 with the super chrome ink. It's just, oh. It's gotta be what, 1920? I don't have a date on that one. Look, you wanna see what good colors like? That's what the colors of these pens originally look like. So, you know, you can get all kinds of information out of here. They actually did drop the Parker Duo folds out of airplanes, by the way. So, anyhow, so I would look for ads. I always bring them to pen shows. Uh, anyway, pen shows that I drive to, um, they're a little heavy otherwise. So, uh, you know, the other thing that I was talking about, if you're going to build a collection, what you really want to do is make connections with um, with other other collectors. J Jason talked about this earlier, how somebody asked, how did you get all this stuff? He said, well, you know, I know people I've got I've got connections with people. That's that's the beauty of pen shows and pen clubs is it's not just what happens on the floor during the pen show. You know, a lot of it happens afterwards at night when you're sitting around talking and having a couple of drinks or something. And that's when the big pens come out sometimes. You know, you, you're over there and you're talking and then the other person says, well, you know, I kind of like this guy. And um, somebody mentions, well, they're interested in a big Chilton. And, you know, that might be a Chilton that I wanted to keep for myself for another couple of years, but thinking more about it, saying, well, you know, I'm in my 70s now, maybe it's time to let this stuff go. And then, you know, that pen all of a sudden becomes available to the right person. So it's it's worth it. It's really worth it to, to develop um, connections with other collectors and, and really to be open-minded. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. I remember I was doing, a, I was one of the early Boston pen shows and um, I was with this calligrapher and he was from Switzerland and he was pretty famous. And we're sitting at the bar having a beer and um, he pulls out a cross century ballpoint and he's gonna draw me a piece of calligraphy. I said, oh, to my, I didn't say it to myself, come to think of it, I said it out loud. I said, what are you using a ballpoint for? I, said, I hate those things. And, and he said, Paul, don't hate anything. And he drew me this beautiful piece of calligraphy using a ballpoint pen. And, and I, I mean, that was 30 some years ago and I still remember it. And I wrote an essay based on that, you know, not, not hating anything and especially ballpoints. I, I like ballpoints. So I'm, I'm not one of these guys. And I, I mean, I, you ought to see the collection of jotters that I have. I love Parker Jot. I mean, there's so much to them. They're so interesting. The history is so amazing. With those, in fact, there's another great book. Um, I mean, I've got, I literally have all the books. This is a book on ballpoints by Henry Gostiny, and this is a book just on the jotter, um, which is a great book. This is, this is, an, if, you're, if you're interested in jotters, this is the book, and I'd get this one too. And, um, you know, there's just so much to the hobby. There's so many different things to collect. And, and frankly, I, I don't think you necessarily have to narrow down what it is that you do collect if you really truly like just about all of it. I mean, I do. And, and I basically buy what I like. Um, but then again, I'm in a situation, I, I don't pay retail for one thing, and I do a lot of wheeling and dealing, and I know a lot of people, so I'm able to build up a pretty decent collection pretty quickly. But, you know, you can get there too, and you can do the same thing. In fact, I won't even walk around pen shows anymore because I'm afraid I'll see something and buy it. 
because it's such a good deal. You know, I just, I don't want to, I'm trying not to buy any more pens and it's not working very well, but I'm trying, you know. So, so, you know, deal, find people that you like. If you go to a pen show and you're over there and somebody rubs you the wrong way, an exhibitor, a dealer, walk away. You know, just walk away. There's like 50 more dealers right down the road from him, you know, and talk to the next person. See if you like that person and if you want to deal with that person instead. You know, it's there's just too many people to worry about that one person who rubs you the wrong way. You know, there's just just too many other people. Uh, you know, so where do you find them in addition to eBay, the Internet and uh, pen shows and pen clubs? There are other ways to get these fountain pens. And uh, I've gotten quite a few through other methods. You know, one of the things you can do is local auctions. There are still a ton of local auctions that have fountain pens. And here's here's another reason, you know, and one of the things that I um I did in this book was I, I had the scenario where um, you know, a pen collector went to a flea market. It was six o'clock in the morning. The, the guy was just setting up and he's having his coffee and you approach the guy. And um, the guy says, yeah, I, I got a whole cigar box full of them. In fact, I just got them off of a collector and nobody's even seen them before. You're the first one. And uh, so the guy brings a box out and he says, listen, your choice, $50 each. I don't know that much about them, but I know they're worth money. So you could pick out whichever one you want, 50 bucks each. And you look into the box and you see all of these pens and, and you just don't know. You know, there, there's some that you heard about, but you don't know if they're the best ones. You've got all these other pens and some of them are covered with dirt, but they look okay. But you don't, you don't, $50, you know, you got 250 bucks on you. All right. And, and, you're thinking about it and you're saying, gee, some of these pens look really good. And uh, you say to the guy, he said, well, you know, can you take a credit card? I'd like to buy several of them. The guy says, no, cash only. And so you pick out five pens and you go home and you look up this other pen that you were kind of curious about, but you weren't sure about it. And, and you realize that it was a Parker 51 with an empire cap, but it was dirty and you, you really, you know, you weren't sure. You said, oh my God, you know, that pen's worth $2,000 and you rush back, you know, you go back to the flea market and the guy says, I'm sorry, I just sold that pen 10 minutes earlier. So you, you, want, you want to get knowledge. You really want to know what pens are worth money. And, and still, you you don't want to get into the situation where you buy pens just because they're, they seem like they're a good deal for you because you could end up with, you know, 200 pens that you really have no use for. Um, but every now and then when you get into a situation like that, where you see a pen that's worth $2,000 and the guy wants $50 for it, and he's an antique dealer. So you don't even have to feel guilty about it. It's his job to know what he's selling. Right? So, I mean, and it happens, honest to God, it happens. I walked into an antique shop and something like that happened to me. And, and the guy had a, a yellow duofold, senior Mandarin yellow duofold. Those days, you know, the pen was worth six to $800. And, and the guy, uh, I asked him how much he wanted for it. He wanted $200 for it. And sure enough, I only had $150. And I said, can I, can you hold it for me? I'll be right back. I live 15 minutes. He said, no, I'm not holding it. He said, but there's a, there's a, um, a bank here and you can use your credit card and get money. And uh, so I went there. He said, I only wish I had a red one. I said, he said, I, I heard those things are worth big money. Right. So, so I got the yellow senior do a fold for $200. I went to the bank, got the $50 off my credit card. I was never able to pay off the bank to the penny for that $50 for some reason. You, you, you couldn't, you know, it was always like three cents off anyhow. But, you know, that happens and it still happens today. You can still get really good deals on, on vintage pens, but 
you have to know what you're looking at. You really have to know. And, and it's a lot of fun learning. So, you know, the other thing too is, I, I used to do this. Um, put a vintage pen in your pocket, you know, get one that's in nice shape and, and take it with you and start writing with a vintage pen. You'd be amazed at how many people are going to say, what's, what's that? You know, what is that thing? And, and it starts a conversation. Next thing you know, somebody says, you know, my, my mother has like seven of those in the desk drawer. They've just been sitting around there for the last 30 years. I don't know what to do with them, but you didn't want to throw them away. You know, I say, well, you know, I collect vintage fountain pens. Uh, maybe I can buy them off of her, you know, or something like that will happen, I promise. And you can get a lot of pens that way. Or the other thing that I did, and uh, <laughs> you, you, you kind of get into trouble by doing this, but I, I had local pickers. I had about four pickers when I started out. Now, a picker is an antique dealer who knows somebody who collects a certain thing, right? So I collected fountain pens. And I also set up at flea markets. And, and, uh, and you know, the people, uh, I live around Saratoga, and we had a flea market in Saratoga. And everybody knew that Ireno collected fountain pens. So they used to bring them to me. And I got a lot of pens like that. And not only that, I knew all the other people who were there. And so I ended up with about four pickers who would bring me fountain pens. And, but the thing is, is when you have a picker, you've got to buy them all, all right? Otherwise you're going to lose your picker. The picker is going to go to somebody else. But, but you could end up with a lot of fountain pens that way. So, and it's fun. So, you know, friends and family, you'd be surprised at how many people have fountain pens around. Uh, the other thing too is ask. Ask if you're going to a flea market, if you're going to a, you know, a, an antique show, don't just look at the table and, and say, oh, I didn't see any pens and move on. A lot of times those pens are underneath the table. All right, because they're small and people will walk away with them. Or if you're at a flea market, you can't leave them under glass because the heat, uh, the sun will heat them up and it'll destroy them. So if you go to a flea market or an antique show, ask them, do you have any fountain pens? And uh, you'd be surprised how many might turn up that way. The other thing that you can do is advertise. You know, you, I mean, if there's a local paper, or a church paper or something where they're taking ads from people or the fountain pen journal, whatever, you know, collector, long time collector or whatever, collector looking for vintage fountain pens will pay fair prices or whatever, you know. So it works. I mean, you know, it works. So there's there's a bunch of different methods that you can try to, to get different, you know, to get um, pens uh, and even, I stopped going to um, garage sales because I was bringing home too much stuff and my wife was getting angry at me because, but I did pick up a espresso, brand new espresso maker for 10 bucks. And the thing works like a charm, but you know, you know, that's another thing too, is you don't get in over your head with this stuff. Um, and that's easy to do. I, I ended up buying two full size store display cases that have been sitting in my garage for 30 years. And my wife has been on my case from day one to, to get rid of those things. And I, I haven't gotten rid of them yet. And they're just sitting in the garage, taking up space. I haven't done a damn thing with them. So, you know, you can do things like that. You can get taken up and, um, and you could end up in a little bit of trouble because of it. But, you know, that my, one of my favorite things is, is like, you know, when people start off, they're really excited and they've got a lot of enthusiasm. And so they come to my table at a pen show and they say, well, do you have any flexi pens with flexi nibs? Well, yeah, I do, you know, but the thing is, is they get so focused on flexi nibs that they don't pay attention to all the other beautiful pens with other kinds of nibs in them that are probably better suited in a lot of cases for them. 
and they just get hung up on this flexi nib thing. Now I like flexi nibs, but if I'm going to write with a fountain pen every day, that's not the nib that I'm probably going to choose. You know, I'm going to use a nib that's better for everyday writing. And, and, and there are so many different kinds of nibs, so many beautiful nibs, especially vintage pens. If there's one thing about a vintage pen, in addition to all the other really, really great things about vintage pens, it's that they were made to be written with. I mean, you know, they wouldn't survive. The pen company wouldn't survive if they made a crappy pen. Those pens had to work and they had to write well. A Parker, a Waterman, a Schaefer, a Wall, a Carter, any of these pens are going to be wonderful writing pens. And, uh, you know, all they have to do sometimes is, is to be cleaned, put in a new sack, you know, maybe adjust the nib a little bit and you're, and you're off and running. And, and you really should think about nibs other than uh, flexi nibs. I mean, oblique nibs, italic nibs, extra fine. I mean, there's just so many different nibs. And, and collect what you like, really collect. You know, in fact, in this last, this last issue, where did I put it? I wrote, I wrote an article. In fact, I wrote it quite a while ago because before I put out the Fountain Pen Journal, I wrote something called Ereno's Quarterly Pen Review, EQPR. And I wrote an article called, You've Got to Be Kidding. And, and basically it's about the Waterman Taperite, which is a pen that I love. And I think I might be the only person in the world who loves that pen. So I, I, got, I got this beautiful set and this is a long, it was before my daughter was born. It had to be 30 years ago. And I get this beautiful Taperite set. It's got gold caps, you know, pen and pencil. And it's got the person's name and this beautiful script on it. And so I bring it to the pen club meeting and I'm proud of it, right? I want to show my friends and everything. And, and the one guy looks at it and he says, oh, yeah, nice pen. Too bad it isn't a 51, right? And I, and I said, you, you got to be kidding. I said, look at this thing, you right? And I, I mean, I, I just love this and I got, I have it to this day. I mean, I just love this set in, you know, in a Waterman taper, right, by the way, I mean, some of those hooded nibs that they made to compete with a 51 are because the 51 came out or junk. But if you get a Waterman taper, right, it is not junk, especially the better ones. They made all kinds of uh, taper rights. And, and it's an absolutely beautiful pen and it writes like a dream, but nobody wants that pen. Nobody. I mean, and they're out there. You can get one for like 25, 35 bucks. It's unbelievable. And, and they're absolutely beautiful pens. Another pen is that I love that nobody else cares about. In fact, they'll probably pay you to take it is, is the, um, the uh, Waterman CF, right? It was the first cartridge filled pen, 1950s, early 1950s. And it's a little skinny pen, right? By today's standards. But guess what? Pretty much all of the pens in the 1950s were thin, right? Schaefer Thin Model Snorkel, uh, the, the CF, the 61, the 51, they weren't that, you know, the girth wasn't that great. And so they were thin, so nobody wants them. But you know what? So today everybody says, well, I need a big pen. And, and I say, well, why? You know, can you write with a pencil? If you, you know, people write with pencils and nobody complains about it, they just write, pick up the pencil and they write with it. Well, guess what? A fountain pen is easier to write with than a pencil. So I say, try writing with a Waterman CF. You'd be amazed. Plus they have a ton of different nibs and, and they're beautiful writing fountain pens. And you honestly, I mean, you can get one for 15 bucks and those things were expensive. They came in all different levels. And some of, you know, they were ex as expensive as a Parker 51. And, and you could get them for nothing, basically. And, you know, you don't have to have 50 of them like I do, but, you know, one or two would be nice. And, and the other thing is, is like they come in two-tone colors, some of them, which I think is cool because the 50s, early 50s were all about two-tone colors. So, you know, but those are just pens that I like. And you, you're going to find pens out there that, that you're going to find interesting. And, and just because other people 
don't like them doesn't mean that you shouldn't either. I mean, I would, I, but, but it's important to know about the pen. That's why I go back to the ads and I take a look. And if you look at some of those um, CF ads, you're going to find that those, that they use a lot of precious metal and that they were expensive. And just because people are overlooking them right now, doesn't mean that that shouldn't be a pen that you want to write with because they're wonderful pens. So, so that's just, uh, you know, another example, uh, you know, and then, then, you know, we're talking about building a collection. There are people, there are so many different ways to collect fountain pens, uh, especially vintage fountain pens. Um, and there's a lot of room for everybody. You know, some people really get caught up in like the nomenclature on the pen or these little aberrations. You know, I, I have a friend and I won't mention his name, but he got so excited because the dot on the Schaefer that I had was on the wrong side. I mean, he went to the moon. It was just like the greatest thing, you know, or 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 the fact that on the barrel, it said um, on this uh, Parker uh, duofold, it's a duo vac, right? Because it had duofold and vacuumatic written on it. And, and it was unusual. And, and some people really are into these little aberrations and, and they go looking for them and it makes, it makes their day when they find a pen like that. Other people could care less about it, you know? And does, do, do those aberrations make the pen more valuable? Um, yes and no. You know, if you find another person who really is going to go over the moon for this particular kind of thing, yes, it does make it valuable for that person. But generally speaking, most collectors are not, they're not going to care about it. So no, it doesn't make the pen more valuable. It depends on who you're talking to. And, you know, it's, that's just the way it goes. There's people that I know who have to have their completest. They have to have every single model pen in a particular series. They have to have every single vacuumatic that was ever made. They have to have every single ripple pen that was made. And, and they go, you know, and they go searching high and low for these things, which is fine. But there's other people who have pens that are just, they just, the entire spectrum of the uh, fountain pen universe. They have one of these, they have one of these, they have one of these, they have one of these. And they're, you know, and, and they're happy. So, so I would say it's just a matter of thinking about what you want to do and what you want to collect. And just be aware that you're, your tastes and your interests are going to evolve over time. And, and, you know, and you'll just find yourself, you know, evolving as a collector. And, and you'll probably get to the point, if you stay with a hobby long enough, that you won't care about the pens as much as you care about the people. And, and for me, this whole thing about collecting fountain pens and building up a collection, um, you know, I was as bad as anybody in the early days. I mean, you had to be aggressive when you went to a pen show looking for fountain pens. And then, you know, we got older and we got to know each other better. And over a period of years, we became friends. And at some point I realized that the most interesting thing about pens is the people behind them. Um, the people in this hobby are really a great group of people. They're very interesting. Uh, I never met a dumb collector in my life. They, they tend to be intelligent, thoughtful people. And, and they have a lot of interests other than fountain pens. So that when you go to a pen show, you end up learning a lot more than just about fountain pens. I mean, look what I learned about the F-16. You know, when I went to my first St. Louis pen show, I never dreamed, I thought a freight train was going through the airport. And I look out the window and I see this F-16 flying at eye level. And then the next thing I know, the thing shoots straight up. And I said, what? What is this? So I, I talked to Dave. And I said, why do they go up like that? Was the guy just showing off? And, and apparently not. It's because they look for clean airspace. Right? Right, Dave? It's getting away from all the... All the so it, it's kind of like a, a Nova episode, you know, you're watching something about whales in the North Atlantic and you learn something about sunspots or sunstorms 
whatever, you know, because you just there's there, you just pick up all of this information. You get to meet you all of these great people. What, Dave? You can't learn less. You can't learn less. Right. I don't get it. Think That's about okay. it. You, you can't learn less. No, so, you can't. I got I got you. All right. So, but you know, that to me is a real value of pen shows. When I, I think back and I I realize that I wouldn't know any of these people if I didn't go to pen shows. And uh, to me, that's that's the best part of it. Just having all of these friends and having all of these pens on top of it, you know, what could be better? So, you know, the one other thing is, um, you know, so what do you do when you're looking at, at pens? Uh, you know, and if you, especially if you're starting out, well, you may not know a lot and you may be a little bit intimidated by people, but there's still questions that you can ask. And the first thing, like I said before, if you're dealing with somebody that you really trust, you're going to be on safe ground anyway. All right. But but if you're talking to somebody and you see a pen, ask questions about the pen if you're not sure about it. You know, ask them if, you know, do you know anything about the pen? Do you know if the pen has been repaired recently? Are there any problems with the pen? And you'd be surprised at how, you know, people might not say anything if you don't ask. And, and it's not necessarily right or wrong. There are people who say that they demand that the exhibitor give them a full disclosure about the pen. Well, you know, maybe they, they feel that way, but it doesn't mean that everybody else feels that way. You know, if, if you go up to a table and, and you ask somebody, um, well, how much do you want for the pen? And the guy says a hundred bucks and you take a hundred dollars out of your pocket and you give it to the guy and walk away. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. But and then if you get home and you find out that it has a crack on the cap lip, um, it's too late because you didn't ask. And even though you'd like for that person to give you a full disclosure, it doesn't mean that he has to. It doesn't even mean that he knew that there was a crack in the in the cap lip. You know, it may be that you bought the pen off of um, off of a young person who is selling his deceased father's pen collection, and he doesn't know the first thing about fountain pens. So there are all kinds of variables involved, and you're just not going to, you know, you can't demand that people give you a a full disclosure about the pen because some of them first of all, may not know. And there are other people who feel that, well, it's up to you to ask the questions. Myself, I try to tell people everything I know about the pen. And if there's, if there's a problem that I know about, I definitely try to tell them about it. But not everybody feels that way. And you can't expect them to because they just don't. So that's another reason for dealing with people that you trust. So, so you have to look over a... Um, you have to look over a pen carefully. Just the act of looking over a pen sometimes will make that person more forthcoming about what he knows about the pen. So uh, it may not, but it may, you know. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to get involved in, let's say you have a bunch of pens that you, you bought early on and you're not interested in them anymore, Bring them to the pen show with you or bring them to the pen club and, and trade other people for pens that you want. Just because you don't want that particular pen doesn't mean that another person wouldn't be very happy to have that pen. But just, you know, before you do that, try to get an idea of its value and um, try to offer the pen at a fair price. Um, don't offer it at the highest price price that you've ever seen the pen sell for and don't offer it for the lowest price that you've ever seen the pen for. You know, sometimes people, other people sell pens for me. I had a, a Waterman Patrician, a man, you know, the new one from the 1990s and it was blue. And I was at the San Francisco pen show and I sold the pen to the guy for $475, just like that the guy took out the money and gave it to me. And he came back later and he was pretty smug about it. And he said, you know, 
There's a pen just like that on eBay for $750 right now. So I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, I didn't complete my thought, which was, looks like somebody's on a fishing expedition, you know, and he's going to try to get somebody to pay him. So, you know, you look, if you're, if you're going to look at eBay, what you have to do is go to completed auctions and see what the pen sold for, not only one pen, but like say five or 10 of the pens and come up with an average price for a pen in the same condition. So, you know, so that's, I mean, basically a start. And, and, and there's just one last thing that I, I wanted to touch on. Um, you know, whether or not when you get involved in building up a collection, especially, um, you know, vintage pens, um, are they a good investment? I would say no, absolutely not. In fact, I've written that down on paper and put it in a book. No, I do not think pens are a good investment at all. I think pens are a horrible investment. You know, there are there are people like me. Now I'll go to pen shows, I'll sell pens, basically maybe break even. You know, it costs about fifteen hundred dollars to do a pen show, roughly, especially if you have to fly. And, and if you sell $3,000 worth of pens, which is basically average, you don't even break even. Because my, my experience is, is that if I buy $3,000 worth of pens, or excuse me, if I sell $3,000 worth of pens, I probably have close to $2,000 in them. So, so if I go and do it in settlement and the pen show costs me $1,500, I've lost $500, but at least I've been able to go to a pen show and have fun for $500 instead of $1,500. So that's how I look at it. And I think you're going to find that, you know, most vendors or exhibitors at pen shows are pretty much in the same boat. They're, most people who are set up at pen shows are not professional. They're not making their living selling pens. Okay. They're, they're hobbyists. They're there to have fun. And, and I think most of them are going to treat people fairly. Now, I did a couple of seminars with, um, I did one with Glenn Bowen and one with another fella. And, and they said that pens are a good investment. Well, maybe for some people it is, you know, and for somebody like Glenn who sold his pen collection and started a pen magazine, it probably was a good investment for him. But, you know, if you're just the average collector and you're say 75 years old, You've been collecting pens for 40 years. You've got 500 pens sitting around the house. You do three pen shows, two pen shows a year. You sell eight pens at a pen show. And you're, you're, you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't know. At this rate, it's going to take me 40 years to get rid of all of these fountain pens. And I didn't even make costs. So I would say for the average person, no, I wouldn't consider um, uh, pens to be a good investment. All I know is I've had a ball doing it. I really enjoy it. I love the people and uh, it keeps me occupied. You know, it's, I keep on learning and, um, and it's a lot of fun and I get to meet a lot of people. So that's what I have to say about building a collection. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, I've got a question to start us off with. So let's go back to the uh, the guy we encountered at the flea market. He's got his uh, cigar box. He's got a handful of pens in there. You're looking through them. He's got maybe 10 pens. You think he can afford three of them, but you're looking through, maybe there's a couple common names, but you know, maybe there's some you've never heard of. Here's brands. I don't know what this is. Never heard of that. You know, the pens are all kind of maybe a little dirty. I'm not sure which ones are good, which ones are worth you know, dropping the money on, do you have any pointers to kind of make a decision to say, you know, this is maybe one I should take my chances with, um, anything to look for, anything, uh, you know, that might stand out that people could say, hey, you know, this one, this one's worth uh, dropping the money on and taking home. Yeah, I think, um, in fact, it's, I mean, it's, there are basic things to look for that can separate cheap pens from good pens, all right? Uh, in fact, in the first pen book that I wrote, I had developed a system so that people could determine the value of pens themselves 
rather than having it prescribed, looking and saying, oh, this pen's worth $300. And basically, expensive pens have certain features that cheap pens don't. You know, the biggest one, I think, is collectability status. And that you just have to know about. You know, everybody knows that a Parker 51 with an Empire cap is worth a lot of money. All right. But basically, big pens are worth more than little pens. All right. Pens that have really good color that aren't all discolored are worth more than pens that are discolored. Of course, you have to know what discoloration is as opposed to what dirt and grime is. But if you see enough pens, you, you'll figure that out pretty quickly. And, uh, and I mean, celluloid pens um, deteriorate and you, they, they become discolored. And um, the other thing is, look at the nib. You know, if it's got a big nib, the bigger the nib, the more expensive the pen. And if the nib has writing on it, like if it says Crocker, or if it says Parker, or Chilton, and number eight, you know, or something like that, you know that that's, that's a valuable pen. Um, a pen, most pens with small nibs are not worth that much money. In fact, I actually had a chart that showed a number eight nib, a number six nib, and a number two nib. And, and the nibs, uh, the pens with the number eight nibs are worth a whole lot more money. So, and then, then you look for, I would look for, um, you know, writing on the pen itself. You know, any good pen, any really uh, pen made by a major manufacturer is going to have nomenclature on it. It's going to have, you know, the brand where the pen was made, maybe a model number, something like that. And, and so that means something. And if the pen is a cheap pen, there are certain giveaways to that too. Um, on a lever fill, on a cheap pen, the lever basically is going to separate. Where the lever is, there's a hole. And because they didn't cure the celluloid properly, it's going to have a gap and it's going to be bowed there. That's a cheap pen. Don't, don't buy that pen. Don't even buy that pen anyway, because you know if you buy cheap crappy pens and you start writing with them, you're going to say, oh my God, this is what vintage pens are about. No, no, this is not what vintage pens are about. You're getting the wrong information. You want to get a Parker or a Waterman or a Wall or something like that. That's the pen that you want to test out and see what vintage pens are all about. You don't want to use a cheap, scratchy, broken down piece of junk and say, oh, is this what vintage pens are about? No, don't do that. So, um, you know, that's what I would look for, basically. I mean, that, uh, just off the top of my head. And you could pretty much, if it's got a steel nib, and this isn't universal, but if it's got a gold plated nib and the thing is all corroded and everything, chances are it's a cheap, junky nib. Just because it has colorful celluloid uh, doesn't mean that it's good. The other thing too is on the cap band, on a cheap pen, uh, they, were made to mimic the more expensive pens. So on a Parker or a Waterman or whatever, a wall, you're gonna have that thick center band, and then you may have a small band on either side of it. Those are separate bands. Takes a lot of work to do that. Now, a couple of them may be missing, but they were there originally. On a cheap pen, what they did was they made one band and they painted in the section on either side of the central band so that it looked like three bands, okay? Universally a cheap pen when they do something like that, all right? It's just a trick. Another trick that you gotta watch for is on cheap pens, what they do a lot of times in big letters is they write 14 karat gold. And then where they stick the nib underneath the section, it says plated, all right? So watch for that. That's a junky, crappy pen, don't want it, okay? Don't, don't get, I don't know if I've said this emphatically enough, don't buy junky pens. It's not worth the money. You're throwing it away and all it's doing is it's gonna call you, cause you problems. And, and the other thing too is I wouldn't, especially starting off, I wouldn't buy problem pens. That's something I'd watch out for because 
you know, you say, oh, this is a beautiful vacuum attic, except this is broken. Or, oh, this is a beautiful duofold, except this is broken. Next thing you know is you've got 10 problem pens that you have to take care of and you don't know how to fix them. And all it does is it sits in your head and you don't know what to do about it, right? So that's another thing to think about. Cool. Thank you. So Otto asks, how old does a pen need to be vintage? <laughs> I, I had this discussion recently. In fact, somebody wanted to write an article for the journal and that person wanted to just, you wanted to say, from this year on, these pens are no longer considered to be vintage, they're new. And I said, you can't do that. I said, vintage is not a term that's used in that way. You know, it's, it's, it means old, it means made in the past. It has a non-specific meaning. Now, when I started off, and this is quite a while ago, any pen past the Parker 75 is what I considered new because that's when they stopped using fountain pens, basically. You know, I look at it as when fountain pens were being used uh, and when eventually they stopped being used and ballpoints took over, then all of a sudden we had this rebirth of fountain pens in the 1980s. And those were new pens, you know, but now some of those pens like the man 100 Waterman, like the Schaefer Connoisseur, like the uh, who did it, Parker Centennial Duofold. Now those pens are 40 years old. How can you not call them vintage if you want to? They're vintage, you know? So I, I'll look at it and I might say, well, you know, let's say a fountain pen has been out of production for 10 or 15 years. Well, maybe it's time to call that vintage. But you know, you're gonna get a battle from people if anybody really cares. I mean, does it really matter? I would, it doesn't matter to me if you want to call this one vintage and I call it near vintage. I don't know, you know. So that's how I look at it. You know, there's really no set day that, you, I mean, because they constantly move towards being called vintage over time, right? So you can't set a date. It has to be something else about that pen that makes it vintage. You know, it, it becomes old, it's not made anymore, it's vintage. You know. All right. And Brian asks, are the nibs that say warranted 14K worth it or stay away? No, they're worth it. They're, I mean, they're, they're probably good nibs um, just made for a, a lesser manufacturer. You know, there are first tier, second tier, and third tier pens. A lot of these um, second tier pens are very good and they're worth collecting. And a lot of the pens made by Parker, Waterman, Schaefer, Wall, they made lesser pens that are also worth collecting. Like the, uh, oh God, oh my, I'm having a, uh, uh, what is it? not this Duofold Deluxe, but the, uh, well, you know, the later Duofold Deluxe, by the way, was a second tier pen. But, you know, but those pens are excellent. Or if you take a Parker Challenger, you know, or a deluxe challenger. There, there, I mean, there's, you don't have to just go for the, you know, the premier pens of the decade made by the major ma manufacturer. They made a lot of other pens that are also very good. I mean, I've got some, I should show you, but they're, they're absolutely beautiful. You know, they were made in the thirties. I've got some, they're absolutely pristine. They weren't top of the line, but they're lovely pens. They're great to write with and they're worth collecting. Mm -hmm. That, that, you know, that's, that's another thing. I, at, a, at another pen show, I, I must have been at a pen show where I had driven to because I had three tables to stuff, right? And, and this young person came up to me. I don't think he was 30. And um, he said, uh, he was looking for a pen. So I said, can I help you? And he said, takes a step back and he says, listen, I'm a pen user, not a pen collector. So I didn't say anything, you know, I was thinking to myself, well, I'm, I'm a pen user too. In fact, I'm a writer and I actually write with fountain pens, but I said, you know, I said, well, I said, I'm, I'm a pen user too. And he said, well, then why do you have all of these fountain pens? Like 
like I'm a hoarder, you know? And, and I said, because I'm saving them for you. And, and it went right over the guy's head, you know? I mean, part of the reason for collecting vintage pens, and it might not be the primary reason, but, you know, you want to make sure that these things don't end up in the garbage. You want to make sure you're basically a custodian and you want to make sure that they remain available for future generations because it'd be a shame to see these things go be thrown in the trash and you know lose yet another beautiful pen that somebody could be writing with so you know so there's a lot of reasons to collect fountain pens and especially vintage pens that's all i've got Cool. I've got one more question. And this was one back when I was uh, sitting in Ann and Dave's dining room, we were discussing how we were going to run this whole virtual thing. And we were talking about this presentation and Ann wanted me to make sure to ask about uh, how do you, I guess, it's a little bit on the morbid side, but you know, a lot of times people will collect, they have kids who just don't care about the pen. So it's kind of hard to really you know, leave your collection to, you know, kids who might just throw them out or, you know, whatever. How do you plan, um, you know, for that day when you're no longer around? What? That's, that's a great question. Yeah. And I have a lot of experience with it. And I brought it up. We were talking, I was with another group whose name shall remain hidden because they got mad at me because I was talking about that issue. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're into they're in the acquiring mode. And and here I am, I'm going on the other side of this slope at this point, and I'm trying relatively hard not to buy any more pens. It's not working out as well as I was hoping, but I'm trying. And and it's hard to stop. I'll, I'll admit that. But I'm not a hoarder like that kid thought, because I can sell a pen, I can let it go, and it doesn't bother me. All right. So I know I'm not a hoarder. But so I've I've helped a number of people who are in that situation. All right, and when I, you know, when I was saying building a collection, uh, you know, you really have to have a perspective. And because someday you're going to have to get rid of all of these pens that you've collected for 30 years. And, and uh, it's, it's a hell of a lot easier, a lot easier to buy a pen than it is to sell a pen. You know. I'm not talking about giving the pen away. You know, you paid $300 for it and you sell it for 50. But if you want to get anywhere near uh, that amount of money that you paid for it originally, it takes a lot of work. And it's not going to happen all overnight. And, and it's going to cost money to sell that pen. Uh, you're going to have to go to a pen show, for example. Pen shows are expensive. Um, if you want to participate it and stay there for four days, hotel costs, so on and so forth. If you want to sell it on eBay, the cost that you are the money that you receive from eBay is basically somewhere between wholesale and retail, probably more towards the wholesale end. And by the way, there's a 17% surcharge because you have to pay eBay and PayPal. So you know, maybe, maybe you get wholesale prices when you're, when you're done with it, if you're, and then you have to go through all the work of listing the item. So, so how do you undo all of that? Um, you don't really, not, not easily. You, um, you could do what I've done. All right. I, I have a website. I, I put six or 700 pens up there and that's, kind of like the tip of the iceberg you know my my daughter is not interested in these pens so i told her i'll i'll, I'll tell you I, she bought a car and i said how would you like to you know pay for your car by selling pens on ebay so you know so i'm getting rid of a pile of pens like that my wife is happy because i'm getting stuff out of the house my daughter's happy because She's paying for a car and I'm happy because I'm not giving my daughter cash. I'm making her work for it, right? So it's a win, win, win situation. So you can do that, but that takes years. It takes, I'm talking years, decades. And, and even 
even if you do it that way, you're not going to undo everything. You just, I'm talking about having a lot of pence, uh, saying about a thousand pence, all right? And, and look, at, if you've got a thousand pence, and if each one of those pens is just worth a hundred dollars, that's a hundred thousand dollars. So you're talking about a lot of money. For some people, it's a lot more than that. And um, so, you know, it, it's, and then you get into a situation where, God forbid, if something happens, then you get, I hate to call them vultures, but, you know, it feels that way where you get people calling up and wanting, you know, wanting to buy the collection and, and pestering the family at a, at a really bad time, not knowing whether or not, you know, you can trust these people or not. And uh, so, so luckily, you know, and, and, and it's kind of something that we do in the hobby. We watch out for, for our friends, you know, and I've, I've done this several times where, you know, a friend of mine has passed and I, I, I've helped and I've sold the collection off because that's what you do. And, um, but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of work and um, it's not done easily. Um, so if you're getting into this, uh, you have to understand that that's, that's part of the deal. At some point, you have to undo what you did. And generally speaking, it's a lot more difficult to undo it than it is to, to acquire a fence. A lot, a lot more difficult. Uh, it's so easy to buy a pen, right? It's so easy. It's, it's not so easy to sell them. It really isn't. You know, I, I mean, just taking a pen, it takes... If somebody wants to buy a vintage pen for me, it probably takes me an hour to two hours to prepare that pen and get it out the door for that person. Just one pen, you know. New pens are so much easier. New pens are, everybody, the condition isn't an issue because they're new. And a lot of these pens, people don't even use them. They just buy them and they put them aside. So you've got all these new pens. All you have, they, people know what they are because you could go on the internet or you could go to, look at Fountain Pen Hospital's catalog or whatever, and you can see, you know, what the pen is, you know what the retail price is, you know that the condition is excellent, not a problem. So, uh, but vintage pens are a lot tougher. Um, so that's why I say I would not look at them as an investment. I would not, not at all, quite the contrary. But, you know, I hope I've said a few things that will help people acquire them in a way that doesn't cost them an arm and a leg. You know, I, I don't like the idea of paying full retail for every single pen. I, I, I never pay full retail, but I mean, I don't think you want to pay full retail for every single pen that you get as well. So helping or so learning, uh, finding different ways of finding them, learning how to repair them yourself, you know, it adds a whole lot of enjoyment. Just learning about, you know, when you when you have a better understanding about the fountain pens, uh, first of all, when you know a lot about them, you appreciate them more. So that enhances your your the value that you get out of fountain pens because you just know more about the pens. You know, like when they started making pens in the 20s, those beautiful celluloid, the black and pearl, you know, those pens, they actually took a piece of celluloid. They chopped it up into pieces, black and white. They put it in a mold. They fused it. Then they, they cut it into blocks. And then they machined the pen. And, and they made the whole damn thing but basically by hand. You know, they had to bore it. They had to thread it. They had to do all of this work. And over, you know, every, every decade, uh, they streamlined the pen making process. You know, they stopped doing that. Next thing they made, the celluloid, they made it in, in, in uh, slices and they put it on mandrels. So they streamlined the process. And they, you know, the first, if you looked at the first dual folds, uh, excuse me, the first vacuumatics, those things were, they had three rings on them. The, um, the end jewel and the section matched. And so they had to make all of these parts specifically for a particular pen. The next generation of dual folds, they had black sections, so you didn't have to match the section. They had a black end jewel, so you didn't have to match the end jewel. And they had one band on the cap, so you didn't have to put three bands on the cap. 
So, and that's the way it went, but it's fascinating. You know, the history, they went from the lockdown filling unit to the easier, uh, you know, later vac unit. So, but it's, you know, very interesting. The whole thing is interesting and it's a lot of fun. And, and all of the design elements, you know, the, you know, the art deco, the art, Art Nouveau, I, I mean, those early pens, those Art Nouveau pens are just, just beautiful. So. Yeah. All right. We got one more quick question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, okay. Susan asks, when starting out refurbishing, better to practice on something cheap and broken or something of more worth? I would start with cheap and broken and work my way up. I mean, you know, the whole thing about getting the section out of the barrel. That's the hardest part about putting in an ink sack, all right? And you have to develop a feel. You really have to develop a feel and you're gonna break a few pens. You no, no way around it. You know, but I, I honestly, I mean, I could get a pen in base. I, I broke one a couple of weeks ago. Wasn't my fault, all right? Because I think the plastic was shot. And that's another thing. Some of these things, the plastic is so brittle um, and, and you have to know which pens have brittle plastic and which pens don't. And, and I, honest to God, I think the guy glued the uh, section into the, uh, into the barrel and I, I broke, I broke the barrel. So it happens. It still happens. I know I'm going to break another pen, but you develop a feel. There's techniques that you have. I use, um, you can actually walk the section out of the pen on some of them. All right, because they're not, but if that, you can't, if it's not that loose that you can walk it out, you know, the other, you have to apply heat. And, um, you know, because at the, at the, but you have to know how much heat, it's under actually 135 degrees. But, but what that does is it makes the plastic more pliable and you're less prone to breaking it. And um, so you have to work on learning how to get that section out of the, out of the, I mean, you know, you should have, a, I mean, there's basic repair. We could have a seminar on basic repair. I, one trick that I, I, I take a, I have a little, basically it's a pen knife, has a tiny blade. And when I take that section out, I take the, um, uh, the pen knife and I hold the nib up so that the section is down and I scrape off the old sack remnants. And I do it that way so that those little sack remnants don't get into the, section of the pen and clog, clog the feet up. And, and the other thing too, is you want to make sure that every single little bit of, of sack remnant is, and it's hard, that it's off that flange that they call it. You know, you have the section that goes like that, and then the sack gets attached on the bottom. Because if you put the sack on and it has a little bump in it where the old sack was, and you try to stick it back into the uh, barrel, you're gonna crack the barrel because the sack is actually too large now to fit into that barrel. So, you know, and that happens. And if you have a cracked barrel, basically you ruin the pen. So. Very good. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This was fantastic. We really appreciate you joining us and being a part of the uh, virtual experiment that we're doing. Oh, Dave says thank you. He's got his card. Well, you guys are great. And I, I appreciate the uh, chance to do it. I hope ne next year at the St. Louis show, I hope to see all, uh, all present at the show. Yeah. And, uh, and thanks for attending the, the, uh, the seminar. Thank you. Great. Yep. Thanks everybody for attending. Uh, the video for this will be available on our YouTube channel uh, sometime in early July. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Everyone. Thanks, See Paul. you in Washington, Paul. Absolutely. You owe me a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <All right. laughs> take care. Oh. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.